This is some data from the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance, or CPARS. Um, they look at uh, animals on farm, at slaughter, and also retail meat, and recover a number of important potential foodborne pathogens and reservoirs of resistance. Um, this is some data from British Columbia looking at chicken from 2005 up through 2019 and their most recent report. And what I just want to draw your attention to here is the recovery rate of Campylobacter from retail meat. So in the most recent year of data, um, 74 of 180 chicken samples that were tested, or about 41%, were positive for Campylobacter. So this is a very commonly encountered organism and really highlights the need for good food hygiene in the kitchen. CPAR's main mission is to look at antimicrobial resistance, of course. And so in this figure here, you can see temporal variations in the percent of isolates which are resistant to a variety of drugs, azithromycin, cipro, gentamicin, and tetracycline. Um, we have different regions of Canada. On the y-axis, you can see the percent resistant and then the years on the x-axis. So highly variable year to year, and we also see differences regionally. Campylobacter infections in people aren't only an acute issue. So it's not just about the diarrhea, but we have a, a rare um, sequelae which can occur following campylobacteriosis called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, this occurs in one in approximately a thousand cases. So if we consider there being approximately a hundred thousand cases of Campylobacter a year in Canada, maybe we have a hundred cases of Guillain-Barre uh, associated with these infections. Guillain-Barre is an acute demyelinating disease of the peripheral nerves. Um, it begins with weakness and tingling in the extremities, um, and it can actually progress to systemic paralysis. The thing that's challenging with this syndrome is that there's no known cure, um, but most people ultimately do recover. So it can be very, very serious. Interestingly, 20 to 40% of people who are diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome um, had a Campylobacter infection in the previous three weeks. So there is a very strong association between Campylobacteriosis and this demyelinating condition. It's also very important to know that there's no correlation between infection severity and the likelihood of developing Guillain-Barre. So you could be very mildly affected and still potentially at risk. In our companion animal species, the role of Campylobacter in clinical disease is difficult to elucidate. And I would encourage you to take any reports of positive fecal cultures with a big grain of salt. Um, the reason for this is that we commonly find Campylobacter in healthy organisms, so there isn't a clear association with disease. Species which would be considered most clinically relevant would be Campylobacter jejuni, coli, and Apsiliensis. In young animals, we're much more likely to see clinical infections. So animals under six months old certainly can get Campylobacter infections. In our companion animals, the disease is often self-limiting, as in people, um, and so typically we don't use antimicrobials. Um, these drugs are reserved for situations where we have a high fever or bloody diarrhea, um, which really indicates uh, that the infectious process involved more than just the intestines. Maybe we have some bacterial translocation from the gut. From a public health perspective, I think it's important to recognize that our companion animals may serve as a reservoir of these organisms, potentially resulting in human infections. So it lives in the gut. We have a very low infectious dose, as low as 500 organisms, and fecal contamination within the household is certainly something that we probably deal with a lot more than we'd like to think about. The issue of Campylobacter in our companion animals is really highlighted by trends and preferences for people to feed uh, raw food diets to their pets. Um, this study here from New Zealand described the isolation of Campylobacter species from dogs and cats, um, as well as uh, raw meat diets themselves. So I've reproduced this table here. Um, they tested 90 dogs. 36% of them were positive for Campylobacter, and these are healthy animals. 13% for Campylobacter jejuni. Of the 110 cats that were tested, 16% had Campylobacter, with 5% being Campylobacter jejuni. Poultry meat, about three quarters of these were positive for Campylobacter, which is certainly consistent with what we've seen in our resistant surveillance studies. And other meat products, we're looking at approximately a third. So there absolutely is 
uh, a theoretical risk for uh, people who own these animals to develop infections following contact with either the animal themselves who's eating raw meat diets or with the raw food itself. Um, just on the right here, I have a picture from Chef Shao in Morocco of these cats eating um, entrails from a local butcher that were put out on the street for them. Helicobacter is a fascinating organism um, in no small part due to the uh, story of its discovery. Um, so this organism is associated with stomach ulcers, um, which historically were thought to be due to stress. Um, but Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, some physicians from Australia, made some really interesting observations when looking at histological uh, specimens of stomach ulcers. So they were actually able to see bacteria associated with the lesions. Um, these initial observations were really dismissed. Everybody thought, you can't have bacteria living in stomach acid. It's far too hostile of an environment. Others thought that perhaps these organisms were commensals or contaminants, um, but it turned out that no, in fact, these were the cause of the stomach ulcers. And Barry Marshall famously proved this by fulfilling Cox postulates on himself. So he actually drank a pure culture of Helicobacter um, and developed stomach ulcers. Ultimately, these findings led to the 2005 Nobel Prize in Medicine, so a highly impactful discovery. Helicobacter species have also been found in a wide variety of animal species, and they may also be associated with gastritis in, in these hosts. Um, it's important to interpret positive results in caution, with caution. Um, we can certainly find Helicobacter in healthy animals, and in our veterinary species, the association with disease is really not as clean as it is in people. In dogs, clinical signs which may be indicative of helicobacter-associated disease include vomiting and weight loss. In this table here, I've summarized some of the common uh, host organism associations that are recognized. So helicobacter pylori, for instance, this is the primary agent in people of gastric ulcers, can also be found in cats, sheep, and non-human primates. Here we have a couple of histological images. Um, on the left, we have one from the stomach of an unknown species. And I think you can appreciate we've got these little structures down here that are associated with bacteria. And then on the right, we have a silver stain um, of a uh, section from a cat stomach. Silver staining is commonly used for looking at spiral-shaped bacteria. And I know these can be a bit difficult to see. So if we zoom in on both of them, uh, on the left, you can see these clear uh, spiral-shaped organisms, um, as you can on the right as well. So histology plays a really important role in the diagnosis of helicobacter infections. Samples that you want to collect really depends on what you're dealing with exactly. So in cases of enteric disease, um, feces or a rectal swab can be collected. I really don't recommend doing cultures because they're very difficult to interpret. Um, healthy animals often have exactly the same organisms. So what are you going to do with that culture? If you find Campylobacter, it doesn't mean that it's causally associated with the clinical signs. In cases of reproductive diseases, uh, for females, we want to collect vaginal mucus. For males, propitial washings. And if we have abortuses, uh, those stomach contents, so fetal abomasal contents, a great place to identify the etiology associated with the abortion, and also the placenta. Campylobacter species are delicate, and they absolutely require transport media. Particularly Campylobacter fetus, it needs to reach the lab as soon as possible in order to recover the organism, which in large geographic regions like Western Canada, where we can have people spread out hundreds or, you know, a thousand kilometers, um, it can be difficult to get these samples to the diagnostic lab quickly enough. For Helicobacter, we want to collect biopsies of affected tissues. Uh, as far as what's actually done in the lab for Helicobacter, we're really relying on histology, um, potentially with special staining techniques, so silver staining. For Campylobacter, culture is absolutely possible. Um, it's going to require some specialized laboratory skills, so you're going to have to know how to work with this organism, working with special atmospheres and, and using these gas pack type uh, systems. There's a trick that can be done um, in order to isolate, selectively isolate Campylobacter from other bacteria, which involves placing a, a filter paper on top of the agar plate and then putting your sample on top of the filter paper. 
Um, because Campylobacter are uh, motile organisms, they're able to swim through the pores that other bacteria aren't able to get through, and that can help to clean up some of the contaminating organisms that may be present in really highly complex samples like feces. Molecular detection is also very, very important, particularly for our difficult to culture uh, Campylobacter fetus subspecies. So this is PCR-based assays. And then we can also do uh, phase contrast microscopy or dark field to see the organisms swimming around in freshly collected specimens. Foodborne Campylobacter is an important zoonosis. So we know this, this is very, very well established. Um, but what about other sources? So potentially pets. Um, I've said that we have healthy carriers very, very frequently. Um, raw food diets are another potential source, especially raw food diets containing poultry. Uh, Campylobacter upsiliensis infections in people may be related to pet contact. When it comes to Helicobacter, um, we do have some species which are found in both humans and animals. So Helicobacter pylori, for instance, is found in cats. Um, and then Helicobacter canis and felis are found in dogs, cats, and people. So while there's certainly the possibility for transmission, I don't think it's nearly as well recognized um, as transmission of Campylobacter species. At present, we have no guidelines for susceptibility testing um, of bacteria isolated from enteric infections in veterinary species. So we have no interpretive criteria, no way to interpret those MICs and say it's susceptible or resistant. So any laboratory reports need to be interpreted with caution. Um, UCAST does have some intrinsic resistance for uh, Campylobacter, although I think it's important to note that these are based on human resistance breakpoints. So in our Campylobacter species, we'll see resistance to fusidic acid, streptogramins, and trimethoprim. Just one new term today, and of course, a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.